um, help me welcome Linda Yoakum. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate that warm welcome. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the candidate forum for the four Republican candidates running for US Congress in the 15th Congressional District seat. This event is being sponsored by the Vermilion County Republican Women's Club under the leadership of Norma Truax. Norma, are you in here? Is she out there? Well, I just want to take a moment and I want to thank Norma for her leadership and all that she's doing here in Vermilion County. Again, my name is Linda Yoakum, and I'm a member of the Vermilion County Republican Women's Club. Tonight, I'm going to serve as your moderator for the forum. Before we begin, what I'd like to do is go over some of the ground rules for the forum. The candidates have received the rules um, for this forum ahead of time. Each candidate will give a five-minute opening statement. During the time of opening statements, um, our runners will pick up any last-minute questions. So as we are about to begin, I'd like to ask if any of you are sitting on any questions, please take them out to the table right away, because once we actually get started, we will not accept any more questions. Due to the time constraints, we may not be able to ask every question that's been submitted. The questions that, that are submitted will become the property of the Vermilion County Republican Women's Club and cannot be returned or discussed after tonight. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to each question. Our timekeepers, Nora and Mary, who are sitting up front here, they will raise a 30-second card to warn the speaker when 30 seconds remain. And then lastly, they will raise a stop card when their time is up. The speaker must immediately conclude his or her remarks. And I want to mention that our time um, limits are going to be closely monitored to ensure fairness to all the candidates. We will conclude with a two-minute closing statement by each candidate. Now for the candidates specifically, if you would like for me to repeat the question, please don't hesitate to ask. I'd be happy to do that. Term of office is for two years. We have Darren Duncan. And, and these are listed alphabetically so the there was no um, preference to the way that they were um, assembled up here. Next is Dr. Chuck Ellington. Next, we have Mary Miller. And next, we have Carrie Wolf. So the opening statements will be given in the order as follows. Our first candidate will be Darren Duncan, followed by Mary Miller, then Dr. Chuck Ellington, and then Carrie Wolf. So we are going to begin now with the um, opening statements by the candidates. Well, greetings to you all. It's so great to uh, welcome you to my home county, Vermilion County. Uh, and I uh, first off want to thank the Vermilion County Republican Women for hosting this event for all of us. Um, especially want to thank my uh, family uh, that's here to support me and my friends. Um, none of us are anything without our friends and family and supporters, so thank you so much for that. Um, being from Vermilion County, many of you uh, know me. Uh, probably for most of my life, as I see uh, people out there that I've known all my life. Uh, I grew up uh, in, uh, outside of Potomac, Illinois, and I live in Rossville now. My family first came to Vermillion County in 1820, so 200 years ago. Uh, my family decided this was a pretty good spot to, uh, to reside and raise a family, and I would agree uh, 200 years later that that's still the case. I uh, am passionate about central and southern Illinois because that's all I've ever known. Growing up on the uh, farm, you learn a lot of things, just basic things, uh, grounded common sense things. And these are things that I hope to uh, 
uh, will enable me to be a good uh, candidate and a great representative for you all. I would um, mention uh, the reason I ever got into public service to begin with is uh, because, and many of you know this, an illness I had when I was 33 and I'm, I'm 48 now. I had uh, colon cancer and that came as kind of a shock uh, to me at that age. And uh, uh, that was at the time our third daughter uh, was three months old. Uh, and uh, then recovering from that surgery and holding her, you do a lot of soul searching about what could have happened if that had taken my life. And then you're looking at the future. And I decided that being a good husband and a good father and try, and try as hard as I could at being those, um, that, uh, and a good farmer because that's how I supported my family, maybe there was a little more that I wanted to do with my life. And so I got into public service. I was fortunate enough to run and be elected to the Rossville Island School Board and serve two terms. And I was asked if I'd be interested in serving on the county board and, and gladly uh, stepped, stepped up and ran for that. And then in the last three years uh, as county treasurer in Vermeer County. And all the while in that, those elected offices, uh, serving in a Rotary and Kiwanis and our Danville Symphony Orchestra Board, uh, the OSF Hospital Board of, Founda or, uh, board of Directors, um, the uh, Vermeer and Advantage Board, just anywhere I could commit myself to service. This is not new to me. I've been doing this for well over a decade. Uh, my passion to serving you all has been there, and that is why I run. I run for the offices in the past or served in civic organizations, and why I'm running now to uh, be your next representative to go to Washington, D.C. It would be a huge honor uh, to be selected. Uh, things that I would stand for in Washington uh, would be a conservative agenda, a lifelong Republican. So I would uh, fight alongside our president for, for uh, uh, defending the Second Amendment. Um, people ask me if I believe in the Second Amendment. Uh, my second oldest daughter, who's in the Army ROTC, wanted an AR-15 for Christmas, so that's what we got. Uh, and also I would say I believe in the Second Amendment because I have three beautiful daughters and I believe in defending my family especially my daughters and my country, if I need to. Also a strong uh, protector of life. Uh, life starts at, at conception. There's a heartbeat. We need to defend that. I also think we need to defend uh, our borders. There are bad people out in the world that would like to come and hurt my family, your family, um, they would, and they would like to slip over the border at times. We need to uh, do whatever we need to do to secure that. Uh, that is build a wall, a fence, whatever it takes. I'm all for legal immigration. Uh, my family came here as a result of legal immigration, and I would uh, support that for others. There are people already in line for that, and we need to make sure that they have the first spots for that. I would, uh, um, again, thank you all for inviting us. Um, as a farmer, I, it, sometimes I go a little long, and they haven't even held up the uh, 30 uh, second time thing, and uh, and I'm ready to uh, to uh, value your time, and uh, and we'll uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. It's a privilege to be here and share with you why I'm running and who I am, and why you should support me for, to be your representative in Congress. Um, I've lived in this district for 43 years. For the past 40 years, together with my husband, we've run our family grain and cattle farm. I've helped in the day-to-day -day activities as well as the running of the business and marketing of our products. I have a degree in business management and marketing as well as a degree in elementary education. I've also been involved in education and many community and church activities. I have seven children and I just found out I'm expecting my 17th grandchild. Um, the reason I'm running is that I believe we've seen an attempted coup on our nation and I want my children and grandchildren and your children and grandchildren to recognize the country we grew up in. I want them to be able to have access to the same opportunities that we've all had to pursue the American dream. I support President Trump. I appreciate him. I believe he loves our country. He's authentic and he's trying to fulfill his campaign promises. I heard him speak recently and he asks important questions such as why have we been letting manufacturing leave our country and why are we allowing ourselves to be taken advantage of in trade agreements. He's a fighter and I am looking forward to going to Washington and supporting the America First agenda which includes securing our borders, defending our Second Amendment rights, supporting him as the most pro-life president we've ever had, 
and fighting against the socialist agenda. Uh, when I announced my candidacy, ever since then I've received overwhelming support, both financially and in light of um, receiving endorsements. I have um, been very humbled and I'm grateful for the endorsements I've received. I've gone through many interview processes and I'm pleased to tell you that I've been endorsed by the Illinois Farm Bureau Activators, Senator Ted Cruz, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, Illinois Family, um, Jim Jordan and Mark Meadows, uh, the Freedom Caucus, um, uh, most of the state reps in this 33-county uh, district, um, Dave Campbell, who started the uh, county gun sanctuary movement because he, believe, he knows that I will always be a Second Amendment supporter, and many others. Um, oh, actually, I just got the Chicago Tribune editorial endorsement also. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for coming and giving me the opportunity to introduce myself. I'm a people person, and I've thoroughly enjoyed this campaign. I've enjoyed meeting people and learning about the issues. I know that legislation or lack of legislation can have unintended consequences, and I look forward to meeting you all and finding out how I can best represent you. Thank you so much. Hi there, it's uh, good to be here tonight. Um, I'm Dr. Chuck Ellington and I'm running for Congress. And I'm a practicing family physician uh, and licensed attorney. I have a, a rural family medicine practice in Arthur, Illinois, where I run a rural training track for Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. There I train young doctors and medical students to work in rural and underserved communities. I was born and raised in Douglas County and I live in Camargo with my wife Anita and my two boys, Gunnar, who's 15, and Jerrica, who's 12, and they're good boys. Wish they could be here tonight. Um, and I decided I wanted to move to Camargo because I wanted to raise my family with the same rural, conservative, small town values that I grew up with. Things like going to church on Sunday, things like giving somebody a hand up and not just a hand out. Ideas like being able to shake a man's hand and look him in the eye and give him your word. And things like being able to learn gun safety and then go hunting with your dad, just like I did. My dad grew up in Marshall, which is just down the road from y'all. And uh, he grew up without electricity or running water or an inside bathroom. And he started out on a crosscut saw at seven years old with my uncle and with my grandpa. And they cut support posts for coal mines. And my dad learned at a young age the value of hard work. And what he learned was uh, that you're not gonna get anything in this life unless you're willing to work for it. And those are the values he passed on to me. Later on, he joined the Air Force uh, where he served honorably. And then he uh, did a number of jobs after that from painting water towers to baling hay. And I think he was baling hay the day my sister was born. And he had the, the big muscular arms to prove his life of hard work. But it was a job that changed his life when him and my mother were uh, a young couple and they had my two older sisters, they got a, a letter in their phone bill and it said, the phone company is looking to hire people and if you're interested, please apply. So my dad went and applied, he took the test and he scored so high that they called him back immediately and they said, we want to hire you. And that's when he moved his family to Tuscola, which is where I was born. Like Ronald Reagan said, sometimes the best social program is a good job. And so, um, he had a good job in the sense of we had a house and we had running water and we had electricity, but I didn't have a silver spoon upbringing. I had to come up the hard way too. I didn't have a family that could send me to college. I had to actually get scholarships and loans to be able to go. I had to work in the summer, detasseling corn, walking beans, baling hay. But that taught me not only helped develop a strong body, but it helped develop a strong mind and a strong will. And that strong will and strong mind served me well when I went on to medical school for the long nights and hours of studying and the sleepless nights at the hospital working, taking care of patients. And my dad, who grew up dirt poor, got to see his son walk across the stage and graduate from medical school. I am a walking, talking, living, breathing example of the American dream. And that is what I want for each one of you tonight. I want that dream to bring you a reality for you and for your kids and for your grandkids. But for that dream to be reality, we have to have leadership. We have to have good leadership in Washington, and that's why I'm running for Congress, because I've seen a failure of leadership. 
No more is that apparent than in the Affordable Care Act, which is neither affordable nor does it provide adequate care for patients. It's been a debacle that has created a morass of bureaucracy and has been a nightmare for many of us to deal with. But that failure has continued on. If you look at the current Democratic candidates, uh, including Elizabeth Warren and her $52 trillion Medicare for All program, and any of the other candidates whose version is basically the same thing, it will ultimately result in uh, the abolition of private health insurance and put everyone on the government roll. I believe we're probably, we could possibly be one election cycle away from socialized medicine. And if you want to know what socialized medicine looks like, just go out to the VA or talk to some veterans and see what they think about how the VA system is working. We've got a lot of good people in the VA system, but the system itself is broken. I want to change all that. If you think about spending $52 trillion, we already spend more than any other industrialized country on healthcare, yet we rank at the bottom of those countries. If you look at infant mortality rate, which is the best indicator of how the health of the country is doing, we rank worse than Cuba and worse than Bosnia. That's a disgrace to our country. I think that this, I think that we can do better. And I think that, that this community and I think our district deserves better. And when I'm elected to Congress, we will do better. I'm asking for your vote. Thank you all very much and God bless. Good evening. Thank you all for being here this evening and thank you to the organization for putting together such a great event in a tremendous facility. So thank you all very much. I'm Kerry Wolf. I am a husband and a dad and a son. I live in Altamont, Illinois, which is in Effingham County. So you take I-57 South, and then Altamont's the next little town west. So just, to, just under two hours from here, so not a bad drive at all. My background is quite varied. I grew up on a dairy farm uh, just south of town. My goal in life was to always return home to the farm to run the dairy, but graduating high school in 85 and the U of I with an ag business degree in 89, we just barely survived the farm crisis of the 1980s. So that window of opportunity was not there for me. So following college, I ended up working in both agriculture and financial services in different professional positions. My career took me out to Central California and then to Wisconsin, where I worked for farm co-ops exporting products to Latin America and Europe and Asia and Africa. In 95, I had the chance to come home to the farm and help our family decide what's the right thing to do here. If we keep doing what we're doing, we're just going to have nothing left and go broke, or is there a way to survive? And we decided, you know what, we really do need to sell the cows and our family will be better off moving on to other things. That was a pivotal point in my life because here I am helping my dad and my uncle and mom and dad uh, and my aunt decide, let's close down the family farm, sell my dream. So after that, a good friend of mine worked for Edward Jones and recruited me to financial services, which looked really good to me because I didn't really want to go around selling things to farmers right then after just closing down my own dream. But it had a pivotal role because ever since then, every role that I've had, I've been in, well, on the sales and marketing, each role has been in an advisory consultant type role where what I do helps people's families and farmers especially hopefully not go through the same thing that our family did. And so that's been a real consistent thing throughout through the rest of my career. My wife from back home joined me in southern Indiana, couldn't use her zoology degree, so we moved to Indianapolis so she could go back to pharmacy school. And she got her doctorate of pharmacy. Once she got out, I came back to agriculture buying grain for Cargill, and then in 2010, we had the chance finally to move back home. And we're one of those unicorn families, those things that don't exist. Have you heard that one before, unicorn family? That's the kids who grow up, move out of state, and actually come back home someday. In this role, that's what I want to be more possible. I want your kids, your grandkids, to have the opportunity to stay here in Illinois and not leave. Because the thing I'm really afraid of is if your kids and grandkids grow up in Indianapolis or Springfield, Missouri, or Kansas City, you may follow at that point that you're retiring and the grandkids are two states away. I don't want that to happen. We need a strong economy here. I've always been that type of guy that when things need to be done, I get asked, so when we moved home, hey, Carrie, we have a Lutheran school in town. Four churches go together to run the school of 170 kids, K through eight. Uh, we need to nominate somebody for our board of directors. Can we put you up? Okay, yeah, I'll do that. Hey, Carrie, uh, your daughter's softball team does, or so does not have a coach. Well, I don't know anything about soccer, but me and so-and-so will learn and we'll coach this year. Um, hey, Carrie, uh, you're done with the Lutheran school board now. There's four openings out of seven on the public school board. Would you consider running? Okay, I'll do that too. So that's the type of person I've always been. I, I look at this as a role of public service. I've never been a politician. When John Shimkus decided not to run again, 
I didn't think much about it until all of our state reps decided not to go for it. You know, the risk to them is they win, they go to D.C. giving up the Springfield role only in two years to come back after the census and after we lose a district likely uh, as the junior Republican up against two other more experienced Republicans. So three Republicans fighting over probably two leftover districts. So at that point, I thought, you know, I know what my conservative values are. I've spent 30 years or 28 years driving up and down the road listening to Rush on the radio and thinking about politics. If, if this is what I believe, that I, and I want someone to be a rock solid conservative to represent our district in DC, if that's what I believe, what kind of an example am I setting to my kids if I don't raise my hand and run? So that's why I'm running. My goal in doing this is to represent you, that your congressperson needs to be your representative to legislation in DC. I'm not, your, I'm not the representative for DC coming back home and telling you how things are going to be. Uh, my goal here tonight and in the campaign overall, I may not give you a lot of answers, but I want you to understand how I think and how I believe so that you can predict that when I'm faced with a question on what to do in DC, you can predict how it is that I will represent you. So thank you very much, and I look forward to sharing more about uh, my vision tonight. And passion for public service, it's much appreciated. Thank you. Now the next portion um, is going to be set up in such a way that we're going to start asking questions. The order that they'll be answered is going to be alphabetical, and we're going to rotate. So the first question that we're going to ask will first be answered by Mr. Duncan, followed by Mr. Ellington, then Mary Miller, and then Mr. Wolf. Okay, candidates, are you ready? And please don't hesitate to ask me to repeat the question. Okay? So, our first question is um, about a pretty recent topic and event. So here it is. How do you feel about our president's interfering in Illinois' decision to imprison Blagojevich, a convicted criminal? I don't think imprison is probably the, the word that, that was meant to be stated here. Um, he was commuted. So, how do you feel about our president's interfering in Illinois' decision to commute Blagojevich, a convicted criminal? Mr. Duncan? Well, I think the president probably realized with what's going on in Springfield these days that there's going to need to be some more room in our prisons and uh, for people. <laughs> So he's uh, helping to let one out who's been there for a while to make room for some others who I think deserve to be there and will go there uh, for their corrupt behavior. Um, uh, I, I, I defend and support the president, but on this one I would not have done that. Um, I uh, think that if you're, when you're from Illinois you realize that there's, and we were, in, we were joking about it just now, but there's a whole lot of uh, corrupt behavior going on with our elected officials and having uh, the governor of the state uh, be involved in that. Um, it's a huge honor for him to to have been elected governor and he abused his power. Um, he uh, deserved to be uh, prosecuted and and, uh, and and jury unanimously found him guilty. He was sent to jail. I think he probably uh, should have stayed there. I think it's interesting though, and I will say this in defense of the uh, president, when I look back and I read my only notes tonight are these numbers and I looked at uh, President Obama's numbers for commutations and pardons, and uh, uh, it was 1,927 in Obama's eight years, which is 240 a year for his eight years. President Trump has done 26 in his three years. That's eight a year. So I don't think the president has made much of a, uh, uh, an issue of doing this. Um, on this one, though, I would not have done it. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Next, Dr. Chuck Ellington. The, uh, first of all, the, the, the uh, uh, former Governor Bogovich was actually tried in federal court, um, and I believe the uh, prosecuting attorney was uh, Patrick Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was really a federal decision, and the president under the Constitution has the right for pardons and commutations. He has the power and the executive authority to do that. I think one of the most interesting ones I remember from George W. Bush was, I think he pardoned an, an old bootlegger or something like that, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, I think the days have kind of changed a little bit from that. But um, 
with regard to um, my understanding of the president's reasons were that he felt like he had served enough time for the severity of what he did. Um, and I think the president is within his right to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, that we don't know all the facts. And it kind of reminds me of a few months ago when there were some issues between Turkey and Syria and people were wanting uh, to be taken off President Trump's support rolls. And I remember thinking at the time that we probably didn't know everything, we didn't know the whole story. And then it wasn't maybe a week later when President Trump sent special ops forces in and took out a terrorist. So um, in light of that, I think President Trump's doing great things for our country and I support him. I'm hoping that he got a lot of dirt in return for it so that we can untangle the mess in Illinois. That's my hope. Well, thank you very much for the question. And uh, as you might guess, my phone didn't ring from the White House to tell me what was up on that. So I don't have any idea. My thought pattern actually is a little bit similar to Mary's. Um, it seems like something strange to do. Can the president do it? Obviously, it's his right to commute the sentence for anybody he wants to. Um, is that all there is to it? Just you know, giving something nice to somebody that he had met in the past through work, or, or you know, if I was in Springfield and I had dirt that I knew Blake Plago had about me, I might be pretty nervous right now, uh, seeing that he's no longer in prison and what did he give up to do that? Is that a possibility? Yes. Is that what happened? I have no idea. Okay, the next question. How serious is the issue of climate change and are we in a crisis? Well, climate change uh, used to be called global warming uh, and prior to that it was called global cooling. Um, and I think that um, the answer to that question is I don't think anyone really knows. Um, you know, there are climatologists that say that climate change is real. There are climatologists that say that the data was cooked. Um, and all I know is the pickup truck that I drive isn't really contributing to climate change and we see a lot of hypocrisy on the left flying around in private jets preaching to others about climate change when they themselves don't live it. Um, I think that it's reasonable to protect the environment. Um, I was taught that from a young age. I don't think that necessarily means we all have to give up our, our trucks or our travel or anything to do that. Thank you. Well, I'm actually reading a book on it right now and it's very interesting and I believe that a lot of what's behind this is totalitarianism and the desire to completely control our everyday lives. I also am, um, I appreciate God's creation. I want clean air and clean water. I do have to say as a farmer, a little um, more CO2 isn't really that bad. Um, I don't believe that we are in control of the weather patterns like we think we are. I think after reading the book, a lot has to do with solar and um, things going on in the solar atmosphere and also um, just long-term, long um, uh, if you look at the long, very long-term uh, registries of climate, I don't think people should be as alarmed as they are, but we do have real um, environmental issues that I think are more pressing. Um, you know, our topsoil is washing down to the Gulf. That's an issue. Um, our pollinators, uh, that is another big issue that we should deal with. So I think that in a way we should deal with the things that are more um, uh, pressing and that would are more reasonable in dealing with solutions. Thank you. So think back to your studies. Can you tell me a time when the, time when the climate in Earth's history was not changing? The climate is always changing. The, the sun itself goes through regular 11-year cycles and cycles of different periods of time, right? So we know over time we should expect our Earth's climate to change. No question about that. Are humans contributing to it? Maybe. To what degree? I can't tell you for sure. I can tell you this, it, it is a shame what we're doing to our young kids who believe that in 12 years it, it's over, that there's no turning back. That's not true, Ab absolutely not true. 
We need to show them pictures of, you know, if you've been to the spaghetti factory down in St. Louis, there's pictures of old St. Louis on the wall. And look at how just black and filthy and sooty the air is in major cities like St. Louis in the late 1800s when we're burning coal. Do we have those problems today? No, we've cleaned up our, our environment dramatically. And yet our kids are convinced that we're dirtier than ever. That's just not true, okay? Um, do we need to take care of our environment? Absolutely, yes, we must. It, it, it's, you know, growing up on a farm, what, what does each generation want to do? Each generation of farmer wants to improve the farm and pass it down in better shape to the generation after them. I think in general, we as humans want our kids to have a better life than we do. So we definitely want to pass on a, an environment that's better for our kids. But at the same time, we can't fall into the trap of believing a, a political, uh, go to, going down a political path which would bankrupt our society for no good gain other than someone's wishes for control. Um, the solution is to deal with how do we adapt to climate change. For example, if, if it's shown to be true that the sea level is going to rise, we need to be addressing what do we do about people who live in zones where the, where the ocean will rise. That's a lot more practical way to help out than, than to shut down the U.S. economy. I don't know whether the global the climate is changing because of what man's doing or not doing. Um, I think that our country has done a lot over the many years, now decades, to improve on what we're doing to the climate, to our world around us. As a farmer, you know, the, again, uh, echoing some of the other comments, the, the land is the lifeblood of what we do. Uh, we try to take care of the earth because it's important to us. And I think that's just common sense. I think we do whatever we can to uh, become more efficient, to protect the earth, and uh, make sure that uh, we are not leaving a uh, footprint on the earth that is not uh, healthy. So whether I know at the end of the uh, day what it is, I remember when I was a kid in the late 70s, we had a whole lot of snows. And, a lot, and we don't have as many big snows, but in 20 years we may have big snows again. I, I don't know the answer. I just think we ought to use common sense and do what we can to, uh, to be more efficient. Thank you. So Senator Ted Cruz supports policies that would hurt farmers. He supports big oil. Would you support Senator Cruz's policies? I don't know all the policies. Are you talking, would I support just that policy you talked about? This is the only one that's mentioned, yes. Okay, well we have coal and oil in our district, so I support coal and oil production. But in addition, we have ethanol plants that use like um, nine billion bushels of corn a year, and I support ethanol production also. Um, was there another part of the question? Just whether or not you support those policies that oh. he has put in place. Um, I support what's best for our district. He's representing his district in Texas. I'm going to represent our district here and what's best for us. Thank you. Candidate Wolf? Well, unfortunately, I'm going to say that we're at a bit of a, at a, at a, bit of a disadvantage here because I don't know specifically what policy you're asking me if I would support Ted Cruz on. Uh, you know, he's from a big state. It's a big ag state. So I think in general, Ted Cruz is probably very favorable to agriculture. It's also a big oil state. So would he be favorable to oil? I would guess so as well. The specific policy you refer to, I'm sorry, I just don't know which one you're talking about. I can tell you this, oil is very important in this district. Uh, the southern part of the state um, has a lot of oil, and a matter of fact, to the next town west of me, Little St. Elmo, uh, oil was discovered there back in the beginning of the 1900s before the oil in Oklahoma was discovered. It was the largest oil field in the United States. So oil is going to be very important to the state. I assume that refers to when uh, Ted Cruz ran for president and he stood in Iowa and said he was against the renewable fuel standard. You know, he was against using corn for ethanol. And uh, so I'm going to make an assumption on that. Um, again, gas and oil is important to the 15th Congressional District. It's, uh, it's something that's not going away and there's a lot of jobs tied, tied to it and we should not discard it. At the same time, I think uh, 15th Congressional dist District produces a lot of corn and soybeans and those uh, commodities that are renewable each year could also be a part of the energy solutions for our country. So no, I would not agree with uh, Senator Cruz. I think renewable fuel standard is an important thing. Farm Bureau stands behind that. 
Um, and I think Senator Cruz is in contrast to that policy, and so I don't agree. I will make one small correction to Darren. That's not an assumption, that's a fact. Ted Cruz is against renewable fuel. He is against ethanol. And that's why I think when we take endorsements from people outside the state, we're putting our own state at risk. You need a representative that's going to represent you in Congress and the interest of this district in Congress. Interestingly, the Freedom Caucus also opposes renewable fuel and renewable ethanol. Um, we don't need people from the outside coming in and dictating what comes on in our state, in, in our district in particular. Interestingly, with the Freedom Caucus, just to remind you, their membership is secret. So you have a secret society, basically, that's helping to run this country and now wants to come into our district and take a, uh, take, impose their policies on us. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is this. What are your feelings about public education? Thank you for the question. That one's very broad. Well, I'm on a public school board, so I'm a very big proponent of public education. Um, if the question goes to should there be a lot of national input, no. You, in your local school district, need to have the most control over what's going on and what's taught in your school. Uh, that's, that's a bedrock thing. If any of you have ever been on school board, that is a bedrock belief. Uh, that we need to make sure that our local schools stay in control. We don't want national control of the school system. Do we need to improve schools? Absolutely. Um, there's, I, I can't even tell you, all, all the different ways in which, you know, we need to be able to support our teachers. We, we need our families to be involved in pushing their students forward to achieve. And we need to be able to give our kids opportunity. Um, we have a huge number of school districts in the state. One of the things coming down the pipeline in the state uh, could be a forced consolidation. Um, there might be some low-hanging fruit there. there. Of those 800 school districts, there are some, I don't know if you know this, uh, where a town may have one district for the high school and a second district for the grade school, for the elementary school. Um, there could be some significant savings in a lot of those situations to have one superintendent over both districts. Uh, our unit is a unit district, and most of them in, in my county are as well, where one superintendent is over you know, all of the elementary schools, junior highs, and high schools all together. Um, so in summary, I guess, what I'm a huge proponent, we need, to keep it, we need to keep our school system strong, we need to support our teachers, and we need to keep the control local so that what is taught in our schools is controlled by you, the parents, and not some bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. Well, I've, been, I've seen this uh, public school uh, question from several angles. For one, as a, as a parent who's uh, uh, older two children, I'm, over, I'm already done. <laughs> uh, our older two children went K through 12 in the public school system. Our younger two went uh, through uh, eighth grade in the uh, public school system, and a very good one in Rossville, I would say. So I've seen it as a, as a parent uh, and the value of that. I served on the school board, and obviously uh, with having committed eight years of public service uh, to, uh, to serving on a school board and passionate about public education because I think it's a great thing in this country that, that any uh, child has access to the basics, you know, learning that what the reading, writing, and arithmetic was the, uh, the the song when I was a kid, right? Those are important. That's important, you know, that they get those basics. That we have a literate society and one that knows how to add, and uh, and whether you have money to afford it or not, we provide it, and and uh, it comes at a, a huge cost to the taxpayers. And I saw that on the school board. I also see it as the county treasurer, and. Uh, uh, I think we could probably do some things, and we did this in, in Rossville with the school district to, to save some money, and uh, that should always be uh, sought after. Um, our older two uh, children, because my wife and I both work in Danville, uh, go to uh, Schlarman, which is a private uh, uh, Catholic high school, um, and, uh, and, and we think that's a great option too. Um, we still pay our... Uh, uh, property taxes uh, back home uh, because, well, one, we have to, uh, and, and two, because we really do believe that other children who, whose parents don't uh, live in Danville and commute to work and, and have that option of providing that school uh, here, it, that everybody has access to a good quality education. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really great question. Um, education is probably one of the most important uh, issues of our time. I'm a product of public schools. And the school I went to was Villa Grove High School, so I was a little blue devil. My wife still says I'm probably a little bit of a devil at times, perhaps. But, uh, but, but uh, I had a great education. 
Um, and I had fantastic teachers um, that cared about the students and that really taught us the basics. And when I went to school, to med school, I was able to hold my own with the best of them, with the guys that went to private North Shore prep schools and places like that. And I think the reason why is because we had local control of the school. The school uh, was involved, the teachers were involved, um, and the curriculum was, was largely locally dictated. Now, yes, there were state standards, but, but the teachers had a lot of input. Um, one of my teachers actually had us read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. Scared me to death, by the way. Um, she probably dragged into federal court today if she had her students read that. I think part of the problem is now that the students, schools have lost that local control, and I think that needs to be returned to the schools. I think that's key and paramount. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so children are the greatest resource of our nation, and a mind is a terrible thing to waste. I am for good public schools. I'm also for abolishing the Federal Department of Education. They take our money and they trickle it back with a bunch of mandates. We're not stupid here. Our state and local governments can figure out how to, our state and our local school boards can figure out how to educate our children. Um, the schools should reflect the values of the community here and teachers should be able to educate the children based on their needs and gifts, not a cookie cutter education. I'm for promoting the basics. And in addition, as I get older, um, I think that we should offer options to our kids. This is 2020 and the sky's the limit. And I'm for thinking outside the box. I think we should allow kids to graduate early, to do apprenticeships, um, to do trade schools at a younger age. And then if they want the college track, that should be available to them also. Thank you. Thank you. As follows, how do you feel about Illinois' red flag laws? I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, and it says pretty clearly, if you, and let's think about this. When our founding fathers sat down to think of some things that really were important to them to put into the Constitution, uh, the Bill of Rights, the number two thing on their list was the, the right to bear arms, that, uh, that, the, uh, that right should not be infringed upon. And I think that I, and I'm a constitutionalist, so I think if the Constitution says it, uh, we ought not to go against it. Uh, and uh, the Constitution does say it. So, um, you know, if a person has committed some heinous crime with a gun, uh, maybe we ought not to give them a gun. But other than that, we need to do all that we can to see that that basic right that was granted to all of us by the federal government is not taken away from us by a state. I'm a proud gun owner and a member of the NRA. I oppose red flag laws, and I'll tell you why. Because the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear arms. That's a fundamental constitutional right. Those rights cannot be taken away from you without due process of law. I have yet to see a red flag law that protects due process of law. No other right can be taken away from you. No other right, but that right, and states try to do that. We must fight against red flag laws because they are unconstitutional. Thank you. Okay, I oppose red flag laws or any laws that take away our God-given constitutional rights without due process. When my children were growing up, we read several biographies of people that lived in Nazi Germany or communist Russia, and they were controlled by fear. And one of the things the government did is they set up a system where the citizens could tattle on each other. And I'm highly opposed to anything that would promote that. Well, my answer may be a bit more disjointed because I have about seven or eight friends who are state troopers or county deputies, et cetera. So uh, we've had a lot of these types of discussions before. Yeah, when you talk about red flag laws from the federal level, so on the one hand, the Second Amendment is there for a reason. It's not there so that we can go hunting. It's not there so we can shoot sporting clays. The Second Amendment is there to be a backstop for the population to prevent a government from becoming out of control and you know terrorizing their population, okay? Uh, that's why we've seen other nations lose their weapons before ultimately a dictator comes into power. So we have to protect those rights. Are there ways that we can help avoid problems? 
if we can identify people who are having problems and taking their weapons or preventing them from, from creating a problem. Now, how many of these shooters have we seen where a, a kid has shown that there's a problem and no one follows up on it? Here's an idea from one of my state cop friends. He says, we don't need the red flag law like they're talking about it in DC. What if we have a law that says, if, if I call one of the local police and say, hey, dad's having problems and I can't get in the house to get the gun and, and I'm really worried here, that there's a time limit that the cops have to follow up and go visit and do their investigative level within 24 hours, something like that. It's just the same as any other complaint that's lodged against somebody where they can go, the person hasn't lost any of their rights and they can ascertain if there's a problem going on. The flip side is what happens today. A uh, neighboring town, gentleman, well known to a lot of folks, going through a divorce, had a really, really bad night, started yelling at the wife and things were going downhill fast. He did something really responsible. He called his buddy who was the, the chief of police, said, uh, you better come over here because I'm having some problems. They went over, ended up taking him to the hospital. He, got, he sought treatment, he did everything he was supposed to. But because it was listed on the input form what was going on, he's lost his void and will probably never get it back. Would you vote to allow taxpayer money to fund the wall on our southern border? Yes, I would, and I'll tell you why. Because for a country to have border, to, for a country to be a country, a country has to have borders. Um, and there's a lot of talk about how do we secure our border. Um, I think we have to protect our borders, and I think it's necessary because we have seen, I think, clear examples of individuals who uh, illegally in our country and commit horrendous and heinous crimes. I believe the president pointed out some of the survivors of those crimes in his State of the Union address. The wall is necessary, but the wall isn't enough. And I think we need to think about a longer term solution as we move forward, but I do propose that. I do agree with that. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I guess I would support it too. Um, our government's so out of control and involved in things they don't need to be involved in, funding things we don't need to fund. But one of the primary roles of the federal government is to protect our people. And so we need to know who's coming in and why they're here. Yes, I support taxpayer funding of the border wall um, and securing our borders and revising our immigration system. I'm for legal immigration. My son-in-law is a legal immigrant from Nigeria. He came here, the first time he applied for a visa, uh, he was turned down, so he got back in line and waited for another turn to come, and he obeyed all the laws. He respects our country, our history, our government, and the opportunities that he's had since he's been here. He's an um, orthopedic trauma surgeon today at a prestigious hospital, and he is a avid Trump supporter. Thank you, Kenneth. Well, Kenneth Duncan? Yes, I also would uh, agree with uh, voting to provide uh, money to build the wall. I mentioned that in my opening statements, and I'm firmly um, in belief of that. Um, I'm interested, or fascinating to me somewhat, uh, when I hear people that are against securing the border and doing so by building a fence. Often they're Hollywood liberals who have big fences around their houses and um, so somewhat hypocritical. So there are, again, agreed that bad people in the world that would like to uh, come and uh, hurt some of our people, our families, and uh, we have to do what we can to defend ourselves and building a wall and having a spot where they come through so that we know who is coming through. And, and I'm not against the, the good people coming through, you know, the people that are, are wanting to come to America to, for the right reasons, but those coming to try and hurt us. Those need to be kept out, and uh, we, you know, history shows that they're going to find their way in. So it's time to secure the border and be be done with that. And um, I, I guess I would also highlight, you know, we would there was a lot of debate in, in Congress at, at one point about providing supplemental funding for the wall, and uh, we even had some Republicans that were against that. Senator Cruz was against providing the supplemental funding to, to secure the wall, and uh, so it's not always just liberals. It's some some within our own party. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Well, Kenneth Duncan? Yes, I also would uh, agree with uh, voting to provide uh, money to build the wall. I mentioned that in my opening statements, and I'm firmly um, 
in belief of that, um, I'm interested or it's fascinating to me somewhat to, when I hear people that are against securing the border and doing so by building a fence. Often there are Hollywood liberals who have big fences around their houses and um, so somewhat hypocritical. So there are, again, agreed that bad people in the world that would like to uh, come and uh, hurt some of our people, our families, and uh, we have to do what we can to defend ourselves and building a wall and having a spot where they come through so that we know who is coming through. And, and I'm not against the, the good people coming through, you know, the people that are, are wanting to come to America to, for the right reasons, but those coming to try and hurt us, those need to be kept out, and uh, we, you know, history shows that they're going to find their way in. So it's time to secure the border and be be done with that. And um, I, I guess I would also highlight, you know, we would there was a lot of debate in, in Congress at, at one point about providing supplemental funding for the wall, and uh, we even had some Republicans that were against that. Senator Cruz was against providing the supplemental funding to, to secure the wall. And uh, so it's not always just liberals; it's some some within our own party. Thank you. What changes do you think we could make to the Affordable Care Act to lower the cost of health insurance? Well, first of all, I understand the challenges of providing health care for a family and being self-employed and having uh, family members that have pre-existing conditions. I do oppose socialized medicine and Medicare for all. I I am disappointed that when the Republicans had a chance to repeal and replace Obamacare, they didn't. But I do believe that if we, um, uh, we there are things we could do to reform uh, the healthcare system. One would be to offer more transparency in what the costs of treatment are. I know um, not too long ago I had a child in the doctor's office and the doctor was suggesting a certain treatment and he tried calling the business office even of the hospital and literally could not, the doctor could not find out from anybody how much this treatment cost would be. So I support transparency in treatment costs. I support um, promoting uh, health savings accounts in a greater way. I support competition um, in, from state to state in getting insurance and portability in our insurance plans also. Thank you. Candidate. Thank you. So my, my best solutions would be that we need to make, the solution is going to come from free market-based solutions. It's not going to come from some government-run program like Medicare for All. That's a boondoggle. Socialized medicine does not work. You, you can go to Canada any, any time in the past 15 to 20 years, uh, you have the same problems you might have living in upstate New York, and yet you're on wait list in Canada. That's why so many Canadians end up coming to the United States for their medical care. That's why people from, even though we complain about our system, uh, before the ACA, people from around the globe would travel here. Uh, they go to the Cleveland Clinic for heart procedures. This is where you come for the best treatments in the world. So ACA has only set us back and more to, made it less affordable. Solutions would include free market solutions, allow insurance companies to compete across state lines, allow groups to form buying groups to buy larger volume um, plans to bring down the cost per person. Take a close look at the pharmacy benefit managers. They're, they're a group here in the middle between the insurance companies and, and the local pharmacies. Uh, they were supposed to be there to bring down drug costs. Well, guess what happened? Wal uh, Walgreens and CVS figured out that, hey, if we buy those, those pharmacy benefit managers, we can take the profit. So I have friends who are small independent pharmacists showing these stats where a certain drug owned, uh, reimbursed from one of these PBMs owned by CVS, reimbursed to CVS, they pay $14. Reimbursed to Walmart and Walgreens, they paid $8. Paid to your local one-off uh, pharmacist, they were paying a buck ninety as the reimbursement that this pharmacist got. So they're using it to drive out the competition. Um, and by the way, it was just discovered in the last couple of weeks that one of them overcharged the state of Illinois two hundred million dollars. That's one state, one state. That's how we start solving the problem. I think competition is one of the biggest and greatest things that we can have. I, you know, whenever the government gets involved and controls things, there's no competition, and, and through their uh, total control, uh, we 
end up usually spending more. I've seen that by serving in government at different levels. So uh, leveling the playing field letting um, and getting the government out, just let private um, entrepreneurship would to thrive would be a good first start. Um, again, it's been said, and I would agree, um, health insurance across state uh, lines, borders would be a great uh, first step. Um, pharmaceuticals across our, our borders, you know, people go to uh, Canada uh, for uh, cheaper, you know, cheaper drugs, pharmaceuticals, and uh, we should, um, obviously something's going on there that we should improve upon and have a free uh, flow of trade uh, that would help us all. Affordable, affordable Health Care Act did nothing to make it more affordable. Our family of six, uh, because of, we were self-employed at the time before we worked in town, uh, our insurance premiums went from $6,000 a year to $20,000 a year in just a matter of three years after, after the Affordable Health Care Act was uh, created. It did nothing to make it uh, affordable. Um, and even at that point, we had to raise our, our out-of-pocket deductible from, 20, I think, 2500 to... Uh, to uh, 7,500, so clearly the government getting involved did, did nothing to improve it. Um, let's get them out of the way and let uh, private enterprise compete. Thank you. First of all, that's a really good question because this is the number one question on voters' minds is healthcare. Um, and first of all, I wanna echo what Carrie said about pharmacy benefits managers. They are one of the single biggest drivers for prescription drug costs in this country. And what happens is when um, Congress people uh, start getting uh, wise to what's going on. The pharmacy benefit managers bring their lobbyists in with their uh, fancy suits and their glossy packages and they, and they woo the Congress people over. That's why it's very important that we elect members of Congress that are competent, that are qualified, that are capable, that understand these issues. But I would say that we need a complete overhaul of the Affordable Care Act. Um, Partly Mary, why the American Health Care Act didn't get passed is because it was a bad law and it would have pulled the rug out from under 20 million Americans and left them without insurance. What we need is a health care plan that is based around primary care. We know that if you have access to a primary care physician that you will live longer, that you will be healthier, and you'll cost the system less money. In the Affordable Care Act, about 50% of the heavy lifting is done by primary care physicians, but primary care gets only 2-3% to of the spending. That's, that ratio needs to change because once we build a system around primary care, then we can talk about payment models. But, but before we even get there, we need to think about how, what it is that we want. That system has to be based on primary care. Thank you. Thank you, Kenan Ellington. I'm going to step away from policy issues for just a moment and talk more about your personal attributes. So the question reads, why do you want to be in Congress and why do you think you are the best person for this position? Candidate Wolf. That is a great question. Thank you for whoever asked that. So, why do I want to be in Congress? You know, as I said earlier, I didn't, I didn't go to school to study politics. I want to be in Congress because I want to represent you. I see a need. The, like I said earlier, the state representatives and state senators who would normally run for this job elected not to, so it leaves a void. Who's going to step up? I feel I have the rock solid conservative values that represent our district well, but more importantly, I'm coming at it from, you know what, this, isn't a this is not a job I need. It might only be a two year job. Uh, if we lose our district, will I be a junior of three Republicans fighting over two seats? Maybe, maybe very likely, who knows? All I know is, I know where my values stand. I know that Washington is a swamp. And I think I can avoid being sucked into it, which means that I will be able to do a better job representing your interests in DC, listening to your ideas, listening to your questions, and serving you and my neighbors. That's why I'm running. When uh, uh, Congressman Shimkus announced his uh, retirement from uh, Congress and right before Labor Day weekend last uh, August, um, had immediately some people suggest that I run, and uh, we had a great local candidate that was gonna uh, gonna run, and I was gonna fully support him. And then he changed his mind for you know family reasons. Uh, and then several people continued to uh, ask if I would run, and I resisted. I did not want to run for Congress. That was never in my dream. I'm very happy doing what I'm doing now, serving as the county treasurer and getting to help out on the family farm uh, as the schedule allows. Um, 
But uh, the opportunity is huge to go to Washington and make as, as big a difference as you possibly can. And that's why I got into the elected office to begin with, was to try and make a difference. I think in my life there's been um, ups and downs. You know, I, I wasn't very happy about having uh, colon cancer, but having gone through that and survived. And uh, uh, you know, Natalie and I had have four wonderful children, but we actually lost the uh, first one, and we went through that. When you live life and have these ups and downs, it, it makes you uh, more empathetic. You understand truly what what people are feeling. I'm just an average guy like a whole lot of other average guys and gals. And uh, I think I've had a, a great deal of life uh, experiences that uh, lend me to understand and to be able to fight hard for, for just the average guy and girl. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to run for Congress because I want to fix health care. Um, I've seen too many people go without adequate health care growing up, and I've seen what that looks like. And I see what the Affordable Care Act has done to our country. I think I know how to fix it, and that's why I'm running. Um, I'm also running because I have experienced and I have lived the American dream, and I want that to be a reality for each one of you, and for your kids, and for your grandkids, and for Danville, and for Marshall, and for Metropolis, and for every community in our district. I believe I'm the most qualified person because I have a lot of experience with it. I'm not only a practicing family physician, I'm a licensed attorney. I've done a health policy fellowship at Georgetown. I've written health policy. I've drafted legislation. I've written congressional testimony. I have the experience. I have the know-how. And I know I can fix health care. I'm asking you for your vote. Thank you. And I'm very energetic and hardworking and um, passionate, goal-oriented, as my children can tell you. I believe I'm going to give account to God for how I live, which means that lobbyists that come to me and try to uh, buy me uh, to sell out the 15th district. I'm not going to do that. I also have a broad range of experience in education and in small business, in agriculture, and in raising a large family. And I understand the challenges of trying to get health care also. Um, I think President Trump did a great job in the State of the Union in laying out a vision for our country. I fully support it, and I want to go support the America First agenda. I'm all about restoring rule of law and a culture of freedom. And whatever opportunities I would have to do that, I would consider it a privilege. Thank you. And it's similar to the question that I just asked, and that it doesn't have to do with policy, but more of your personal attributes. So if you were elected to Congress, what would be your top three priorities once you get there? Well, in my opening statement, I mentioned the, the, the three things that are um, uh, top of my list that I'm passionate about, the, the Second Amendment, uh, pro-life, and securing our borders. But further than that, I would take it a little, little more um, to, to explain. I grew up in a small town of 700, or actually outside of the town, because I grew up on a farm, Potomac, which was 700, 750 maybe, uh, when I grew up. And uh, our high school, Potomac High School, uh, had 97 kids in the whole school, uh, not per class, but per, per, uh, for the whole school and 24 in my graduating class. And um, that is still um, the case across the 15th Congressional District. That is a small town, rural America is the 15th Congressional District. And my background in that, not from birth, I mean, I didn't grow up in you know, a suburb of Chicago or anywhere. I grew up in little old Vermillion County, Potomac, which to me was the center of the universe. And I think in, as you go around the 15th Congressional District, everybody feels that way about their little town. It's the center of their universe. And I understand that because that's where I grew up. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's my passion is defending uh, rural America. Infrastructure needs are great. As we travel, uh, my daughter Emily and I travel across, uh, I think something like 15,000 square miles, 33 counties out of, out of 102 in Illinois, so darn near a third of the whole uh, state. We go in and out of cell phone coverage. Um, uh, today, was, I think it was today, there was a, we were, the GPS, we were using GPS on the car. The road wasn't there. We didn't stop. I mean, it was, it was there. <laughs> but on GPS, it wasn't there anymore. And, uh, so uh, rural America gets forgotten, 
And, uh, and I understand it because we are so few people that we don't have as many representatives in Congress. Um, but uh, I am uh, very willing to be as loud a voice as possible for all the small towns across the 15th Congressional District. Thank you. Candidate. Within 100 days of taking office, I will propose legislation to reform the Affordable Care Act. That's going to be my number one priority. Secondly, um, the I will, uh, second priority will be to bring jobs to this area and revitalize the economy through revitalizing the coal industry, revitalizing the oil industry, and promoting uh, clean coal technology, including near zero emission uh, coal factories and carbon capture technology. The third is going to be border security, again, talking about the wall and then a long range plan to provide true security for our entire hemisphere. Thank you. And I agree with their ideas. I would support their ideas also. But as I travel this district, I have to say it is not only depressing, it's economically depressed. So I would do whatever I could do to promote economic vitality and jobs, jobs, jobs. I will always advocate for Illinois agriculture, Illinois coal, Illinois oil, and for um, ethanol. Uh, I believe we should make it easy for businesses to turn a profit, to be able to uh, invest and grow and bring more good jobs to the area. Um, that includes uh, promoting reasonable regulations. I think we need federal regulatory reform and any regulations that are not making life better or safer for American consumers and workers, we need to quickly do away with. I'm for making President Trump's tax cuts permanent and for simplifying and um, coming up with a more straightforward tax code. Um, President Trump in the State of the Union address brought up opportunity zones and I will advocate and sell and promote the Illinois 15th and Vermilion County for jobs and manufacturing we have everything that everything we need is here to be successful in business and manufacturing. We have a great location to um, send our products to Nashville, St. Louis, Indianapolis, or Chicago. Um, all we need is opportunities, and I will advocate for those. Thank you. Thank you for, to the author of the question because I love this question. So number one, I want to represent your interests. That is absolutely number one to me. My number one priority is to represent you and your interest in Washington, D.C. And then remember I said I wanted you to get to know me a little bit? Well, my, my thinking is basically as a Reagan conservative. I think the federal government has overgrown what it's supposed to do, so what do we do? We want smaller government. We want less intrusive government. We want less spending. All that ties into what I'll tell you next is it, it's all about jobs, okay? How do you get more jobs? Well, you lower taxes like President Trump has done. How do you get more jobs? You lower regulation like President Trump has done. You continue that trend. You don't let the other side battle back with more regulations and higher taxes. We protect where we're at and we make progress by lowering those even further. Beyond jobs, secure the border. After the border is secured, then we can have a discussion about how we're going to fix the immigration system. I think we need a sane immigration system like we used to. We need to have that conversation of how many people can we bring in and, and absorb into our economy in different working groups. Now it's just like wink, 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 let everybody in through the border that you can. That's not how immigration is supposed to work. And then obviously fix health care. We've got to do that. So number one, represent your interest. Two, jobs, 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 secure the border, fix health care. Thanks. Thank you. Senator Dick Durbin publicly stated that he would junk the Electoral College, which he has said he has favored long before the 2016 election, in support of the popular vote. What is your position on this issue? That we need to send Senator Durbin to another um, a state to represent, because he's certainly not representing Illinois with that notion. Uh, the Electoral College is what provide. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm here to support and defend rural America. Uh, that would not do anything to support and defend rural America. That's when you end up with New York and, and, and Texas and California basically deciding who the president is. Now, I probably would agree a lot with Texas as far as their conservative values, but not California and New York. So, no, that is an absolute awful idea. Um, and uh, another reason, uh, I'm going to put a plug in here, that because Dick Durbin is up for re-election this year, that we need to vote him out. And we have several great candidates running for U.S. Senate. Uh, I think any one of us that wins the primary would work very hard 
alongside that candidate to make sure that Dick Durbin is sent um, to one of those states I guess he appreciates more than ours. Yeah, I agree. Senator Durbin needs to be sent packing. I'm not surprised that he said that. Um, if you all have looked at the maps that they've shown in the press, if you do away with the Electoral College, basically the elections will be decided by New York, uh, Texas, California, uh, and Florida. The rest of the country will be left out. Our founders did not want that, and they had the genius and the foresight to know what could possibly happen. One of the greatest detriments to rural America would be to do away with the Electoral College, and I will vehemently oppose it. Thank you. I totally agree with everything they said, and I can't imagine agreeing with anything that Dick Durbin comes up with. Um, and I agree that our founding fathers were brilliant to come up with this system. I just wish we had it in Illinois. Thank you, Candidate Wolf. Yeah, um, I'm gonna agree with, you, with my other candidates up here that uh, it's, uh, it's terribly unfair that the Electoral College exists because it hurts Democrats. Uh, you know, you, you can take it, why are, why are they wanting to get rid of it? It's because it's, it's not helping them. If, if it was helping them, would they even propose the idea? Not a chance. Yeah, in all seriousness, the Electoral College is a bedrock principle that has to be protected because we, if that goes away, like they said, Illinois is lost in the wilderness. Um, we, will, we won't be able to, to contribute to that presidential election. Um, and then you take your smaller states, Colorado's a great example, they, they just gave up their electoral college, they're gonna pass all their votes to whoever wins the popular vote. Why in the world, in a, in a lower population state like that, would you ever do that? You're just giving up your power in Washington. No, it's a terrible idea, and uh, no senator of Illinois should ever have proposed that idea. He's betraying the state. Earlier, we're going to give each candidate two minutes for closing remarks. So we'll start with candidate Ellington. Again, thank you very much for having me tonight. You know, it's certainly an honor to be here and it's an honor to run for Congress. This is democracy in action and I'm certainly proud to be part of it and proud to be part of America. As I stated, I'm a family physician, licensed attorney, I have a background in healthcare and healthcare policy. I feel I'm the most qualified candidate to address these issues that we're facing in America. I thought tonight was a great success and I was glad to hear everybody's opinions and ideas. In fact, I think it was so much of a success that I'm going to propose to my fellow candidates tonight and they can answer for themselves if they choose to, that we have a debate once a week between now and the election. <laughs> and I'm serious when I mean that and if, you have, and if you have trouble organizing it, my campaign can organize that. Again, I'm asking for your vote. Consider me on March 17th. Thank you very much. And I also would appreciate your vote. It would be a privilege to represent you there. Um, my campaign has been based on how I've lived for the last 40 years and how I've raised my children. They are Christian, conservative, supporters of President Trump. And I will go to Washington and continue to fight for those values. Um, my style of leadership would be to um, uh, talk to the people. So if there's issues in coal, I want to go to the coal mine. If it has to do with the VA, I want to go to the VA hospital. Um, I want to relate to the people and represent you properly. Well, it's been a real pleasure to be here tonight. I hope I've been able to show you a little bit of who I am and you've learned a little bit about how I think about things and, and how I might react to different questions that come my direction. Hopefully you know by now that my real mission is to represent you. I want to be your servant representing you in the legislative process in Washington, D.C. And hopefully you know that I won't be that guy who's coming back to just tell you what's going on that you may or may not like back in D.C. Your questions at forums like this or through phone calls and emails that's what will give me ideas. You know, I'm not sitting here saying, hey, I carry wolf, I have every good idea, and this is what I'm going to do when I get to DC. No, it's this face-to-face -face interaction where you can give me your questions and I can go, huh, I never thought about that before. Let me dig into that, let me find an answer. Maybe we can get together with people who have similar concerns and come up with a solution for you. Maybe you come to me and say, hey, Carrie, I got an idea. Wow, that's a neat idea. Who do I go to next to find out if we can vet this idea and get put into a bill. Does it make sense? That's how I will look at doing the job for you. Um, beyond that, you know, it's been a pleasure to be here. Dr. Chuck, getting back, as you can tell, I enjoy these forums, so doing that would be fun. 
although I work for small companies, so there's only 12 of us. I can't not go to work every day, so I'm not sure about the logistics. <laughs> um, the last thing I would ask is one for your vote. I, I would love to have your support to represent you. Uh, in the meantime, if you don't mind going to kerrywolf.com or my Facebook page, Kerry Wolf for Congress, like it, share it with your friends so that more of your friends know that I'm out here, and then they can get to know me and decide, hey, is Kerry the guy? Or is it one of these folks? We have four great people. Thank you very much and ask for your vote. I said earlier that it was uh, not my plan to run for Congress. And uh, my wife uh, is one of those that convinced me uh, uh, to run that. And uh, I, you know, I was reluctant to do that because certainly happy doing what I was doing and being able to stay here in, in good old Vermaine County, uh, seeing my fan, fan, friends and family every day. Um, and I'm not uh, any sort of polished candidate. I'm just an average guy, um, like so many other people in the district, um, just trying to do the best that I can to serve you all, just like I've done, whether school board or county board or now as, uh, as county treasurer. It's a humbling, humbling experience to travel around the, the 33 counties and have people shake your hand and say they believe in you, enough to vote for you, um, let alone a few of them actually uh, give you a little bit of hard-earned money to support your campaign. So win or lose, it has been, it has been so far, and I believe it will continue to be a, a huge honor and um, a wonderful experience to be in this situation to run for Congress. It's a huge, huge, huge privilege to be able to do that and have, you know, we had 2,300 people sign uh, signatures. We needed to sign petitions for me to get on the ballot. We needed 1,300, and in two weeks, we had friends and family get 2,300. And uh, not, not a single one of them paid. You know, some candidates pay for signatures, just, just friends and family and volunteers. Um, and that's why I'm passionate about running, because of those people that believed in, in me so much. And uh, public service started for me years ago. I just want to continue forward. A lot of candidates will talk about uh, their endorsements, and I'm proud of endorsements that we have. We have endorsements from Ford County in the north to Massac County in the south and Madison County in the west and several in between. County officials, former and uh, current state senators and state reps, and I'm proud of that. But at the end of the day, it's about your endorsement, the voters' endorsement. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Um, for not only considering running for this important office, but taking time out of your busy um, campaign to be here tonight to answer the questions of the audience. And I also want to thank the Vermilion County Republican women. Is Norma here? That will not be the feature of 